the spot because he's a he's a big this you know, the guy here, and he'll be out there and he'll wave at you if you need. Everybody set? Okay. Uh, I'm Alex Jones. I'm director of the Jones Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy here at the Kennedy School, and I want to welcome you all to our panel discussion this evening. Uh, I suspect that many of the people in this room have been following in the last week the many sort of uh, moments to chew on the first hundred days of the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration, that is. We're going to take our own bite out of that tonight, and we've got some very thoughtful and also very opinionated and also very informed people uh, to do the talking. I'm going to introduce them one by one. They'll speak uh, for five minutes each and then uh, we will have a brief conversation amongst ourselves and then we will open it up to your questions. So um, uh, with that let me begin by introducing to my immediate left and our first speaker Martha Joint Kumar who is director of the White House 2001 Project, a program funded by the Pew Charitable Trust and designed to provide new White House staff members with information associated with a successful start for a presidential administration. Dr. Kumar is professor of political science at Towson University in Maryland. Her published works include Portraying the President, the White House, and the News Media by Johns Hopkins University Press. And she was also, I'm glad to say, a Shorenstein Fellow in the fall of 1998. Also here, by the way, is Professor Terry Sullivan of Rice University at the, and the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He is the uh, Associate Director of White House 2001. Uh, Terry, are you here? Yes, yes. welcome. Uh, Martha, you're on. If you look at the uh, modern uh, presidential transitions going back to the transition coming into the Eisenhower administration when they first began, you'll see that this administration has, compared to others, done an effective job. The, uh, the model that, uh, that they used and that, um, uh, that many others have uh, uh, or have thought is, is particularly good was the Reagan transition. And what the Reagan transition was able to do was pull together people, process, and their policies. And, uh, and this, this administration was able to, uh, to do so as well, in spite of its being a truncated transition. Transitions matter. They matter how you're going to come into office, what your agenda is going to be, how it's going to be received. That you want to use that early opportunity because it is a time when people are watching. And generally, people now are not so interested in national politics. So they're watching and listening. The difficulty is it's a time when you have the least capacity to take advantage of it because you are new. And putting together a White House staff, which is going to be the core of getting your personnel together, putting your process in place, and establishing your, po your policy agenda, putting together a White House staff is difficult. Lloyd Cutler likened it to City Hall. He said a White House is like City Hall because you're bringing so many different elements together. And you're bringing them together at, at one particular point. When you come into a White House, your drawers there are empty. John Podesta said when he came into the White House as staff secretary, there was an empty desk that had a computer monitor sitting there and a central processing unit that had the hard drive pulled out of it. And it's symbolic of the difficulty you have because here you have no information there, yet you are responsible from day one to try to, to be making decisions. And you don't have a staff that has ever worked together before. Imagine a corporation changing hands and having all of the, uh, all of the memory go out, both in terms of paper, because that's demanded by the Presidential Records Act, but also the people leaving. And so putting together a White House is a, is a uh, difficult enterprise. And, and uh, I think if you, I would just go uh, briefly over the, uh, the areas that I think that one could use to judge this transition. First, looking at personnel. Personnel has been an area that's been difficult because you cannot begin it 
until the uh, until a new president is uh, is declared. At that point, there's a memorandum of understanding between the outgoing and the incoming administrations, and the FBI can begin its work on doing uh, investigations. So at, at this point, there are 33 people confirmed uh, political appointees, presidential appointees through the Senate, whereas at this point in the Clinton administration, it was 48, and in the Reagan one, it is 75. So it is behind somewhat on, on, uh, on Clinton, but on Monday, they, um, uh, Clay Johnson put out a record number of 62, was it? 62. To um, uh, people, na uh, nominations that went uh, from the White House to the Senate. So in personnel, if, um, if you look also at the White House staff, they've successfully put together a White House staff, and we can talk about what some of its elements are. In the area of process, they have uh, set up a decision-making system that reflects the interests of the president and that uh, seems to work for them and has resulted with the uh, president having a approval rating as far as a, uh, as a leader as 63%. And if you look at policy, policy, there are some successes and some uh, some failures that we can uh, th that we can discuss. But they did lay out their agenda, and that agenda reflected what it was that the president talked about in the campaign: M uh, military uh, buildup, tax cuts, education, Social Security, Medicare. Those were the things that were focused on in the campaign, and those were the agenda coming in. They, they uh, wanted to have a take advantage of that early period that people were listening. Number one was education week, second was faith-based initiatives, third, uh, third week was tax cuts, fourth was uh, defense. That they would let people know what it was they were interested in doing, and uh, they did so. In the uh, area of publicity, that has, uh, has been an area that has not worked uh, uh, necessarily as well as the other. While people know what the uh, agenda is of the, uh, the president, there are elements of it that are not so uh, certain that they like, and that the, the president has not has been as, uh, as public as some of his uh, predecessors in terms of presenting himself, uh, say, in press conferences. At this point, he has five. Um, Clinton had 13, Bush uh, Sr. had 11, uh, Reagan had had two, Carter six, and Nixon five. Um, and that's an area that uh, they clearly are developing. And then in the uh, area of, of, uh, of, of politics, um, you have a very well-organized operation there under, um, under the guidance of uh, Karl Rove, where planning is, uh, is crucial to them. Um, but there's some of the issues there during the campaign. You remember that, uh, that uh, Gore's uh, issue positions were preferred to, um, uh, to those of uh, candidate Bush, and, um, uh, and there's still some uh, weakness in, in that area. Thank you very much, Martha. <clears throat> Next is Rick Burke, who is the chief political correspondent and senior writer for the New York Times. You see his articles on politics almost always on the front page, usually above the fold. Since joining the New York Times in 1986, <laughs> he's covered assorted beats, including the White House, Congress, and domestic policy, as well as presidential and congressional elections. This semester, he taught a course at the Kennedy School for the Shorenstein Center. Uh, his course was called The Press and Politician, by, by Politicians Behind the Scenes of the 2000 Election. I might also add that just before we came out here, he told me that, at least in one case, George W. Bush responded to a piece that he had written about the administration with a word that cannot be said out loud in this place on a night like this. Uh, Rick Burke. Thank you. Um, let me just say, um, it's no easy thing assembling a government and doing what, um, what President uh, Bush has done in a very short amount of time. And what struck me instantly is just how different this presidency is and this president and his style and his approach is to the job than, than his predecessor. And the most striking statistic I can throw out at you is um, I asked the Chief of Staff, Andy Card, how much time the President spent putting together the budget proposal to Congress. And he said, in the ballpark of five hours. And I asked the same question to um, Clinton uh, budget people. I said, think back eight years ago, how much time did Clinton spend putting together the budget? And they said, you know, when you count, you know, those, you know, midnight in the Oval Office and the residence, and he was just living the budget. The best estimate I could get from Gene Sperling, who worked with Clinton, who, and he said it was a very conservative estimate, was 75 hours. 
and it's really a striking difference in approach. Now, President Bush delegated a lot of that responsibility to, to the Vice President Cheney, and I think it's all in the eye of the beholder what, which, which approach is better, this approach of delegating responsibility or being steeped in policy. I think when Clinton came eight years ago, a lot of people were refreshed to have a president, thought it was refreshing to have a president who knew the policy and lived and breathed the policy in detail, would sit there night after night, ordering pizza and so forth, and just live and breathe policy. This president just doesn't do that. His favorite line, and, and again, it's in the eye of the beholder. I, this president's favorite line um, during the campaign, or one of his favorite lines, um, was, tell me what I need to know. That's what he would often say in groups. Um, and that was told to me by Don Evans, his best friend and now Commerce Secretary. And Don Evans was saying that as a positive thing. You know, he wants to know what he needs to know, and he trusts good people to make decisions. Now, other people could interpret that as not a good thing, because they might think, well, doesn't he want to know more than he really needs to know? And why trust people to tell him what they think he does need to know? So whatever you say about it, it's a different approach to governing. But the fact that we haven't had really any major debacles in this early stage is pretty good. You know, when you look at, when you look at Bill Clinton's early days in office, particularly, now, I think um, a couple things that they should get credit for, and the reason why it's been so smooth is he's had Dick Cheney, Andy Card, people around him who know Washington. He also, Karl Rove, his political guru, had scripted the first days of this White House. He's even scripted the first months and years of this administration. Everything down to, the, to the re going to the Democratic retreat, how he spent his first days in office, Karl Rove did research, had a bunch of researchers look into how many domestic trips presidents took, past presidents took in their early days in office, how many foreign trips. I mean, they had it all down um, in a very systematic way. Um, the test will come when there's unplanned, when they have to go off script, as happened with China, which I think they endured pretty well, and, and uh, Bush should get credit for that. Now, the the, the as everyone knows, the one, the biggest misstep has been um, his handling of the environment on some of the environmental issues. I think he risks appearing too, too far to the right. He was very effective during the campaign of finessing a lot of issues, not appearing to be too, um, too conservative. Some of his policies or his, the way he's presented and packaged some of his policies risk alienating those suburban swing voters that are so important um, for his reelection and for the Republicans in the midterm elections. And one example of this, I, I was interviewing voters swing in a very um, swing voter area in outside Portland, Oregon a couple weeks ago. And I asked one guy, he happened to vote for um, Ralph Nader. I said, what do you think of the new president? And he said, um, you know, I really liked how he went home. He goes home at 5 o'clock. And it's not quite, five, you know, it's like more like 6.30 that he goes upstairs. But, but he said, I really like how he keeps normal hours. He's very family-oriented. He takes weekends off or he goes to Camp David. But when I heard about his environmental proposals, that scared me. So, so you know, even with people like that who weren't, he wasn't a, 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 a Bush supporter, but he saw good and he saw bad. And I think... We'll just have to see how this all plays out. Thanks very much, Rick. Elaine Kmart <clears throat> is a lecturer in public policy. She has recently returned to the Kennedy School from a year's leave of absence, during which she was the senior policy advisor to the Gore for President campaign. In her first two years at the Kennedy School, she directed the Kennedy School's research program, Visions of Governance for the 21st Century. Prior to joining the Kennedy School, Kmart served as senior policy advisor to Vice President Gore in the White House creating and managing the Clinton administration's National Performance Review, one of the great successes. Before joining the Clinton administration, she was a founder of and senior fellow at the Progressive Policy Institute. She's also a columnist for Newsday and the Los Angeles Times. Elaine. Thank you. Um, I have three ways of looking at the first 100 days, OK? Part, and let me summarize them to begin. Part one. George Bush does a great job. 
<coughs> part two, John McCain does a great job. Part three, Dick Cheney does a great job, circa 1965. So let me start with part one, okay? Why did George Bush do such a good job at the beginning of the administration? Well, there's a very simple answer. He was not Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton went out of the White House in a mess that was really totally unprecedented. And I served the man, I like the guy, but I will be the first to say it was a real mess. So all George Bush had to do for the first part of his administration is simply not be Bill Clinton, and he looked pretty good. Now, <laughs> because of the way Bill Clinton went out of the White House, the, some, norm, some problems got totally overlooked. On the Democratic side, a debate over who really lost the election, Al Gore or Bill Clinton, got totally put to bed, okay? We never really had that debate. On the Republican side, the, the whole question of how George Bush got to the White House, the, all the questions of legitimacy, again, got pushed under the rug because, of course, the news was totally obsessed with the way Bill Clinton was leaving the White House. But as many have found, you can't run a pres presidency by running against your predecessor. Even presidents like Bill Clinton eventually leave the front pages of the newspaper, and at some point, you have to then be your own president. So that brings me to part two of the first 100 days. John McCain did a great job. What John McCain showed us was that in a 50-50 Senate, he could dominate the agenda. He also showed us that it's something that has remained true about this White House and is a little bit worrisome, which is no one is afraid of this president. Now, I've been in Washington much of my life, and let me say that in Washington, fear is a more valuable commodity than love. And this president doesn't cause any fear. Liberal Republicans have taken, taken you know, free reign to oppose Bush. On Monday, Bush had a lunch for the Congress, and less than half bothered to show up. Uh, last week, a Republican senator took the Bush labor secretary and raked her over the coals for the ergonomic standards. The Weekly Standard, a Republican conservative magazine, led with a huge critique of this president's treating, uh, treatment of the China plane incident. Nobody's afraid of this guy. If you've been in Washington a long time, you know that's a sign of trouble. And that brings me to part three. Part three is the first 100 days in which Dick Cheney does a great job reminding us baby boomers of what the world was like when we were in high school. <laughs> In, when we were in high school, we liked Taiwan. China was the enemy, and we liked Taiwan. Back when we were in high school, there wasn't really any need to insist on weapons inspectors in Iraq. Back when we were in high school, there wasn't any need to keep up programs to take care of the nuclear weapons in Russia. Back when we were in high school, we thought nuclear power plants were fine. You know, that was before Three Mile Island. That was before Chernobyl. Back when we were in high school, we didn't know what global warming was. Back when we were in high school, we couldn't imagine that there would be arsenic in the drinking water or salmonella in the school lunches. And of course, we didn't think there was anything wrong with burning coal because we'd never even heard of acid rain. These are just a few of the highlights for the first 100 days. And I, for one, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, for one, hope that they continue. Uh, but all joking aside, let me say that there are a couple, two dominant impressions I take away. One is that after this first 100 days, people still have se severe doubts about George Bush's ability to be president. The same doubts, frankly, they had on election day. This should have been one of his jobs to overcome. In fact, he has not only dispelled this suspicion by being too scripted, by being too organized, he is making people think that he and his handlers are afraid of the job. They're afraid of mistakes, afraid of gaffes. As a matter of fact, one columnist has called George Bush the first A4 president, first president who's happy to be on page A4 of the newspapers. <laughs> 
Um, and his administration has, in spite of all this vaunted, these vaunted meetings on time, this administration has managed to contradict itself a lot on a lot of topics, which of course makes you wonder, well, who's in charge? Who's the boss? Second, after 100 days, we are even less sure of what a compassionate conservative is than we were during the campaign. Um, and in fact, policy-wise, this administration just looks conservative. They don't look different. They're not a different Republican party. The problem with this is that the voters don't like it when candidates do bait and switch on them. When the candidates say, oh, vote for me, I'm one thing, and then they get in office and they turn out to be another thing. And here, instead of having a different kind of Republican, we have a kind of inarticulate Newt Gingrich. And I don't think that's what anybody was looking for. So let me end with the following comment. I spent the 36 days of the Florida recount hanging around at home, waiting to be called to a Gore transition meeting that never happened. So I had a lot of time on my hands, and I read the autobiography of John Quincy Adams. Now, John Quincy Adams was the other president, whose father was also president, and who got to the presidency in a way that, shall we say, had less than a real mandate. Three things stand out about that presidency, and I think that they bode ill for this one as too. This one too. Adams never got over the election of 1824. It haunted him throughout his term. Adams never seemed to understand what was happening in the country. He was of a different generation. He didn't understand the huge new enfranchisement, the opening up of the West. Uh, he was kind of yesterday's politician, and I think that's what this administration is. And finally, because of the way he was elected, he never had control even over his own party in Congress. They did exactly what they wanted to whenever they wanted to. To my amazement, I was not the only person in the country last winter reading the autobiography of John Quincy Adams. Carl Rove, George Bush's chief political advisor, was also reading the autobiography of John Quincy Adams. And a couple months ago here at Harvard, we had a rather strong disagreement about whether or not this was predictive of the future of Bush's presidency. And so I will leave you with the question, is this man John Quincy Adams or is he not? And don't all rush to Widener because there's only one copy of this book. <laughs> and before I took it out, it had not been checked out in 15 years. <laughs> And, and now for a <clears throat> somewhat different perspective. <laughs> Clay Johnson III is assistant to the president for presidential personnel and deputy to the chief of staff in the George W. Bush White House. He also served as chief of staff to President Bush while he was governor of Texas and as the Bush-Cheney transition team's executive director graduate of Phillips Academy, Yale, and MIT's Sloan School. Mr. Johnson has known President Bush for 40 years. His work experience includes stints at Citicorp and Pepsi and as director of the Dallas Museum of Art. Clay Johnson. Turns out that John Quincy Adams isn't the only person that hadn't gotten over the election yet, so. <laughs> 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 Move the clock forward here, Elaine. <laughs> uh, I have obviously a different view of the first 100 days, and I think the first 100 days, it's really the first 145 days, starting from when the, actually from December 4th, because we began the transition uh, really before the election was called, I think on the 13th. Uh, actually, we began the transition about December 4th of 1999, uh, when the president, as is his custom, wanting to be prepared and planning ahead, um, charged me to put together a plan for the transition and what should our goals be and how do we organize to accomplish those goals and so forth. Uh, I believe this, my opinion, obviously very biased, uh, is that this administration has gotten off to a fabulous start and I believe it's because it began a year plus ago. We put together a very good plan and then one of the key objectives in a transition is to identify uh, good cabinet officers and senior staff for the White House. And the person primarily responsible for putting together the senior staff in the White House is the chief of staff. And the more time the chief of staff can have 
to work on that subject, the more the greater chance he or she has of survival and success. Uh, the primary, one of the primary things that we did in the transition that I think has, has borne fruit during this first 100 days is we got the president to do what most presidents running for, people running for presidency do not want to do, which is decide who their chief of staff is to be and ask him to be the chief of staff before the election. So that Andy Card had been asked uh, and had accepted and was on the ground uh, prior to the election, beginning to have conversations with the president, not being presumptuous of victory, but doing what is very hard to do. When you're fighting for your political life, to also think beyond that and to think about what you want your White House to be and who you want to have conversations with your chief of staff to be and to think about who you want to be in this position and that position. So Andy was on the ground and working and conversing with the president, now president, then when he was just governor and had yet to be declared the uh, victor in the election. And so that by December 4th, uh, which is when the first people hit the ground to start assembling a transition team, and by December 13th, which is when the president was declared, I think that was the day when he was declared the, the winner, Andy Card had made, with the president's consent, almost all the senior White House personnel decisions. It was decided who was going to go where. By contrast, uh, President-elect Clinton didn't pick Mac McClarty, I think, until about December 15th. The thought of getting a six-week later start on picking a senior, picking a chief of staff, and then him starting to pick the senior staff then, means you can only get off to a slow start. And by their own admission, they focus too much on the cabinet, not enough on their senior staff. And most of the historians will say, the thing you have to focus on first as you're preparing to set up an administration is the White House. You can't ignore the cabinet, but if you can have one or the other in place, have your White House in place. This White House senior staff was in place because of a lot of advanced planning, because of some uh, personnel decisions, key personnel decisions made by George W. Bush, even prior to the election. Decision was made early on also to involve, in a, in a very, I uh, think it's very abnormal, uh, is to ask the president, the I mean, sorry, the vice president to be the uh, chairman of the um, transition. So you had two very seasoned Washington hands uh, integrally involved in the transition, and they knew it ahead of time, and they were able to start preparing. We could start planning and so forth and so on. We had very clear-cut objectives during the transition so that when we got to January 20th, even though we had only had 40-some-odd days, we had accomplished what we wanted to accomplish because we had very clear-cut goals and we kept focused on them because if you don't have those kind of goals in a transition, the incoming, the incoming job seekers, the incoming advisors, the incoming wannabes, the in incoming everything will consume you and you will spend all your time responding instead of being proactive. But we were focused and disciplined, as I think is true of this White House, on a few clear goals, and we accomplished them. And so on January 20th, we were where we wanted to be, even though we had only had 40-some-odd days to do it instead of the normal 70-some-odd. So I believe one of the reasons why this administration, or the primary reason this administration has been so successful uh, is uh, in the way it's done. You might disagree with some of the decisions they've made, but the manner in which they on about their business, the business-like fashion. Uh, I mean, I guess the alternative to being business-like and having a strong, experienced staff is to have an inexperienced staff that's not business-like and meetings don't start on time. So I'm not sure I understand the argument against an organized White House uh, or an inexperienced, or against an experienced staff or people that have Washington experience. But we had those people in place. In fact, the senior staff in the White House had begun to meet for the last 10 days, two weeks of the transition twice a day to get in the habit of meeting with each other and communicating with each other and to begin to talk about the president's schedule as if we were in the White House. Again, practicing to, to be in the White House, uh, corresponding with each other and understanding what our responsibilities were going to be starting at noon on January 20th. So a lot of planning, a lot of focus, a lot of rigor and discipline, a few agendas, a, a commitment to do a few things very well. That was the mark of the transition. That has been the mark, I would suggest to you, the primary mark of this first 100 days. Again, you may disagree with the decision we made, but America, all of you, no matter whether Republican or Democrat, I would suggest to you can be, should be very proud that our country 
uh, whether you voted for them or not, our country is being led by a very professional White House. Thank you very much, Clay. <clears throat> and next and last, we will hear from David Gergen, who is co-director of the Center for Public Leadership at the Kennedy School. He served as director of communications for, for President Reagan and held positions in the administrations of Presidents Nixon and Ford. He also served as counselor to President Clinton on both foreign policy and domestic affairs, then as special international advisor to the President and to Secretary of State Warren Christopher. Last fall, he published Eyewitness to Power, The Essence of Leadership, Nixon to Clinton, which made the New York Times bestseller list and had a great deal of wisdom, I think reviewers would agree, on just this moment, the 100 days. David Gergen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me begin uh, by expressing on behalf of many of the students here at the Kennedy School our thanks to you, Clay Johnson, for coming here today and spending uh, a lot of your day. Uh, I say that because Clay Johnson has one of the toughest jobs in Washington right now, uh, putting together uh, appointments, getting them up to Capitol Hill, getting them uh, ushered through the process has become a nightmare. This system is broken down. Uh, one of the reasons uh, why the Clinton, number of Clinton approvals is lower than, a uh, number of Bush approvals is lower than others uh, is partly the long count on the election, but it's also a, uh, an issue that this system is broken down. And if there's anything all of us need to do, it is to both work on repairing the appointments process to the executive branch and also addressing the looming crisis in the civil service. Uh, but in that context, to take a day out and to come here and spend your afternoon counseling with individual members of this school, as you did, is something we thank you for, sir. That was very kind of you to do that. <clears throat> Let me also just uh, part company with my good friend Elaine, Elaine Kmark. We have been together in the trenches a lot. And Elaine, uh, your analysis of John Quincy Adams, uh, excellent, all counts, except you left out Andrew Jackson, Andy Jackson. He was there looming over John Quincy <laughs> Adams and then, you know, took it back from him. And Elaine, you know I'm old enough that I knew Andy Jackson. <laughs> I work for Andy Jackson. <laughs> and Elaine, Al Gore is no Andy Jackson. <laughs> the, uh, in my judgment, the first 100 days have usually been the most precious time in the life of a presidency. It's a time uh, when you put your stamp on the office, when you introduce yourself as president to the country, when you establish the momentum, the direction for your administration, and so much flows from those early days and what you, what you can accomplish in those first early days and how firmly you can grab the country by the collar and say, let's go this direction. Uh, and I think one of the curiosities right now about the Bush administration, if I may say so, is uh, this is unusual because I think this is a president who is still very much a work in progress. We, he has, he's clearly growing into the job. We don't, as a country, quite know who he is in a way Clay Johnson does. Clay room with him some 40 years ago at Yale and has a very good sense of him. The rest of the country is still trying to figure out sort of quite who he is. Uh, and that's unusual. It, it may well be that the second 100 days in this administration could be a lot more important than the first 100 days. And that will di di distinguish this administration in many ways from the ones in the past. On, on the positive side, I think you have to say uh, that uh, George W. Bush has brought in the minds of most Americans an honor, a decency, and a dignity to the office that they welcome. And you have to give them credit for that. Uh, it's also true he has brought strong uh, managerial talents to the office. He has, he has created a sense of goals. He's created focus discipline, uh, and in comparison of some of his predecessors, I would have to say he's been a much, much higher level, especially the Clinton years, but you can look at others, even the Reagan years. He, the, the, the Bush administration has been more disciplined in the pursuit of what they've been about. Substantively, you may agree or disagree about the agenda, but you have to say they have changed the national agenda. We are not talking about the same issues and having the same debates today that we were under Bill Clinton. Uh, the tax cuts is not something we were talking about under Bill Clinton. Uh, and he has a 50-50 Senate. He has only a nine-vote margin in the House. 
and he's gotten three quarters of what he looked for in the tax cuts. Uh, the, on the split on spending, the Senate wanted to go for 8% increases in spending. The House wanted to go for 4% increases in spending. The President wanted 4. Today they agreed to 5. He got three quarters down from where the Senate was. So substantively, he's making progress. He's got missile defense on the agenda. You may not agree with missile defense, but if you look at it from his point of view or the point of view of his base, he has gotten many of the issues on the agenda that he wanted. So from that point of view, from that point, point of view of managing the issues he's done by the lights, I think, of most objective observers, he's made a lot of progress toward his, you know, what he believes in. Interestingly enough, I think his political management has been less successful than his substantive management. Uh, and I say that in part because he is a quiet president and I think he's having a harder time. He hasn't yet found a way to rally the country behind him beyond his own base. He's done very, very well with his base. Conservatives are ecstatic. Republicans are ecstatic. He's having a hard time in a country that's, that's pretty divided bringing others with him. And I think that's going to be one of the great challenges of his administration. It's interesting, the Gallup, a Gallup poll that came out recently, among Republicans, he had a 94% approval rating. Among Democrats, he had a 39% approval rating. That's a 55-point gap. If you look at the presidencies from Eisenhower through Carter, the average gap has been 35 points on the approval ratings between the two parties. 55 points is a big, big gap. It's the biggest we've ever seen. There were two other outliers. One was Reagan, who were low 50s, and the other was Clinton, low 50s. Bush is bigger at this point. So that seems to me one of the real challenges. Now, I have to say, at the end of the day, I think there, that is not a time, I think it's too early to make large judgments about the Bush administration in terms of what it's going to accomplish these first months. It's, I think at the end of 200 days, we're going to look back and say, you know, he got a lot of his agenda through. Uh, and he's going to get credit for that. But I still think there's some questions that, that remain out there. One question goes to what Rick Burt was asking, and that is, is he going to establish him through his own application of himself to the issues and getting into the issues through his own curiosity, is he going to establish his hold on the office so he dispels the notion that he is a captive of others? I think he's made some progress on there. He's not there yet, but I think it's a question. Secondly, the question arises, where indeed will he wind up on the political spectrum? Is he going to govern, try to govern as a center-right president or as a very conservative president? And we've seen it go both ways here in the last few months. There was a time he looked like he was swerving right. In the last few weeks, I think he's tacked back more toward the center. I'm not sure Clay may be able to enlighten us on where he would wind up in that spectrum. But for a while, I have to tell you, there was a real difference between what Reagan was doing and what Bush was doing. Reagan essentially talked right, but he tended to govern more to the center. And Bush was in a position where he seemed to be talking to the center and governing more to the right. And I think it was causing some of this dissidence that people were, were struggling with and trying to come to grips with. Finally, I do think the question arises of whether we all know, I think, or really coming to appreciate having an MBA in the White House, the first MBA in the White House. He has brought strong managerial talent to the White House. But we all know, I think now, he's a good manager. I think the question remains, is he going to be a good leader? And I, I think the answer to that question is still out there. I don't think we know the answer to that question. I hope, I told Warren, I warned Warren Bennis, who is a guru about leadership, who's sitting here on the front row. At some point, I'd love to hear from him tonight about uh, Bush as leader and a judgment about that, but we'll wait and see. But I think those are the questions that are outstanding there as the end of 100 days. Yeah. David Gergen, let me ask you, one of the, essentially, the way most of us see this administration is through the filter of the media. When you look at the media coverage, what do you see, first of all, and what do you see especially that the media has not attended to that they should, that things that something and things that are important that they should be more attentive to as far as this administration is concerned? Interesting question. Rick would have a, a better sense of this than I would. Uh, I, I think the media really uh, has not, it, it, we, the media tends to be so interested in personalities that I think that really because the country is now looking at a different agenda, that it's worth a serious discussion about what the, you know, the merits of that agenda. 
Uh, you know, it, it, we, we had a debate on the, uh, you know, some people here agree with the agenda, some don't, but it's really critical that when things are this big, we have a big, big debate. And I think it's been hard to have a debate in this environment. We've tended to, it, it's been fairly scattershot. Uh, and one of the interesting things that I think arises over this last week, it, it, it's quite, quite interesting this week that the administration is coming forward. I mean, Dick Cheney gave a speech on uh, energy, big speech. The president then gave a speech yesterday on missile defense. He named a social security privatization uh, commission today with Moynihan and, 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 and Parsons, uh, Dick Parsons as co-chairs. Uh, and you've got the, uh, the, the tax budget uh, package going through, plus you've got the education bill going through. That many, those are all big deals, as Dick Cheney would say. Uh, and it's very hard for the media to get their hands around that many issues at one time mm -hmm. and have a really serious conversation about what those all mean. Well, let me, let me, let me, I don't, let know, me, whether, I don't yeah. know whether the administration, it's interesting. I think for, in, in terms of craftiness, it's very crafty to put a lot of controversial things out at the same time because nobody can have, you know, nobody can knock down anything because it's all over the place. It's, it's too diverse. At the other hand, if you want to persuade people about the merits of missile defense, then you really have to block out some time to allow the president's message to get through and really work with it. And, and frankly, a heck of a lot more Americans are going to be interested in social security privatization than they are in missile defense. So if the administration really wants to persuade the country about missile defense, I, this was an odd way to do it. Well, one of the things that has come out in this discussion about the first 100 days that really surprised me a lot was an op-ed that appeared in the New York Times by Bill Kovitch and Tom Rosenstiel about how taking the New York Times, the Washington Post, Newsweek, and the networks as the model, there were 40% fewer stories about this administration than there were about the Clinton administration. In Newsweek, it was almost 60% fewer. Rick, what, what's to be made of that? I mean, the, just, the, just the simple numbers of stories. Well, I think a few things. One thing is people aren't as focused on the White House as they once were. We're not in a time of crisis. I remember when I came to the New York Times um, when Reagan was president, and every time Reagan had a press conference, we blocked out on page one two stories, even before the press conference, one for whatever he said on foreign policy and one for whatever he said on domestic policy. We don't do that anymore. We have a president can have a press conference and it doesn't even get on the front page because the presidency is just not as front and center as it once was because except in times of crisis, when, when the China situation was going on, there was a lot more attention to the president. So I think that's one thing. I think also this president hasn't been particularly controversial. And I think a president like Clinton who came in, gays in the military, um, some controversial moves, I think that's gonna generate more press attention as well. I think in that op-ed piece, they were making the case that we're just bored or less interested. I think the public is just not quite as focused right now on the presidency. Um, and that's why I try to go out and talk to voters, people out in the public, what, what do you think about this president? And people, say, you know, voters say generally they don't pay a lot of attention. They, they have a vague um, sense, I hear from Republicans, a general sense we're relieved to have someone who's brought integrity back to the White House. That's the first thing they'll say. Democrats will say, this guy doesn't know, you know, he's not good with words. You know, it's embarrassing sometimes. That's the first thing they say. People remember, talk about the language and the political skills a little bit. They talk about how he handled China, but they don't focus on policy. They don't focus on things like how much the tax cut did he get through or not get through. They're thinking about more about big picture and even some of these little things like personal style. Let me, Clay Johnson, let me ask you, based not just on, on President Bush's attitude, but the whole White House attitude of how they feel they have been portrayed in this first hundred days. How, how would you characterize I want to characterize the White House opinion about yes. how mm -hmm. I think they've been feel like they've been portrayed fairly. I think um, uh, there's been good coverage. There's good challenge. There's supposed to be. That's what the press does. Uh, one thing I, I again I haven't talked to Karen Hughes and Carl Rove and Ari Fleischer about this, but I think uh, they're comfortable not being on the front page above the fold every day as the the major focus of whatever it is that's going on in America. Uh, some people believe in big government. Some people believe in little government. Some people believe that everything ought to flow out of Washington. Some people think otherwise. I think it's a group that thinks otherwise. And my personal opinion is that they're 
pretty comfortable with that, but I think in general that they feel like the, the press coverage has been uh, fair. Well, George W. Bush has, has given Maureen Dowd the nickname the Cobra, which suggests that he does not particularly welcome scathing criticism. How, how does he deal with things in the press that, that annoy and, you know, aggravate him when he sees something that, uh, that he, you know, is, is genuinely harshly critical? Uh, he deals with it more professionally than anybody on this stage probably <laughs> would. <laughs> uh, I mean, if the criticism's fair, uh, he's respectful. If it's unfair, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, less respectful. Let me, uh, let, let me ask you, Martha, a question. Within the next hundred days, the results of the recounts that the newspaper consortium is doing in Florida will probably be in. Is this going to be a postscript or is it going to be a big deal? Well, I, I think that it, uh, it is not going to be a, a, a big deal in the sense that so far what we've seen is that indications that, um, that Bush won Florida. Um, and if the public, if public believes he's president and you're not going to change that. Um, but in going, in, in going back to, I'd like to go back to the, uh, the Kovach and Rosensteel piece. One of the things to take into account, uh, I think, in the, in the president's coverage is that the, the President Clinton left in, a, in such a different way than any of his predecessors. Not only was, were there the pardons, um, which were, uh, which were uh, on the front pages for day after day after day, but then there were a series of time bombs that, uh, that were left behind, which are the executive orders. And those things are going to be popping up uh, week after week and month after month, such as you know, this arsenic in the water. And those are, uh, those are issues that they had not anticipated, an agenda that they were left behind that, that uh, mm. had nothing to do with their own. And that is not something that, is, that has happened that a president has had to deal with in the past. So comparing with earlier administrations as far as the amount of time, the space they got, I think that's um, relevant. I'd say also that, uh, that the 24-hour news day, the news cycle makes a difference. There is, a, if you uh, look at the president's uh, speeches, missile defense uh, was, uh, was on CNN, and a lot of the, the uh, speeches that he's given have been covered in real time. Mm. Uh, so newspapers are, and uh, news magazines are dealing with information differently than they did uh, several administrations back. But if you look at the coverage, one of the things you can see is that there is a consistency over administrations in what kinds of stories are of interest to people at the beginning. And those are, are stories about the people, the new people, and the new programs. And those stories tend to be positive stories. And I think that's been the case in this administration as it was true in uh, the Reagan administration. Elaine, let me ask you very quickly one question. One of the things that has been you know, clear throughout this 100 days as the environmental stories came out, as now the, uh, the strategic uh, defense initiative and so forth, is the silence of Al Gore. Is your guy going to come out now in the second hundred days? Is he uh, is he poised to get back in? Is he going to be involved in the uh, uh, midterms? What do you think? I think he'll be involved in the midterms. Okay, I don't think he'll be out very much this year. I don't think he should be. I think if you listen to his um, concession speech, there was a very strong sense that the system, with all of its flaws, had worked, and there was a president, and he ought to have. You know, he ought to have some time to go about doing the business of the presidency, and I think that's what he's doing. I would certainly not recommend that he be out there right now. Um, I think there's been some pretty talented people in the Senate who have made the case um, in terms of what the Democrats think about what George Bush is doing on certain issues. Um, and so I don't think that Al Gore should be out there right now. I think it would probably backfire on him if he tried to be out there right now. Um, and I think he feels that this president deserves um, a chance. Now, we are moving, however. We are, what, what you try to do in the first 100 days is you try to say, OK, what do we see here? Are there hints? for broader themes, problems, if you're in the opposition party, opportunities. And when is the first test? The first test isn't the 100 days. 
doesn't really matter what people think in 100 days. What matters, the first test is the midterm election well, and then the re-election. I mean, it seems to me that with the, with the aggressiveness of the, of the Bush administration in genuinely pursuing its agenda, we really may be having, for the first time in a long time, a debate that people are really going to engage in. Because now it's not theoretical. Now it's actual. And I don't think people can ignore it in a way that they did in the hypothetical world of a campaign. But now, let's open it to questions. Uh, there are two microphones up here. There are two down here. Uh, I invite all of you, uh, or any of you, who would like to question uh, these folks about the issues before this uh, group tonight to uh, take to the microphone. If you would, please make it a question and make it brief. And I would ask those of you who are, uh, and identify yourselves, please. And also, I would say to the p people on the panel, we're trying to get as many in as we possibly can. So try to limit your responses to about two minutes. Um, my name is Felicity Spector. I was a, a mid-career MPA student last year. I'm a journalist from Britain. And I want to ask a question about the, the way the rest of the world perceives President Bush. Uh, we didn't hear a lot about that. It, I think it's a very different perspective from outside the United States, especially in Europe, where a lot of people feel very let down by the fact that America doesn't seem very interested anymore in what Europe thinks or in Europe at all. Um, and especially issues like missile defense and uh, the Kyoto Treaty. Europe doesn't even figure, it didn't seem, in, in, in the deliberations. And that seems to chime in with one of the worries that a lot of uh, international people had during the campaign was that President Bush uh, hadn't traveled anywhere outside the States. Is this a man who, who lacks a certain curiosity about the rest of the world? Is it a man who doesn't care about the fact that the world is made up of uh, very interconnected organizations nowadays? What exactly is President Bush's view of America in the interdependent world which we thought we had in the 21st century? Clay Johnson? Well, um, David would know better than I, but my understanding is that White Houses uh, in the first year of an administration, they go in a cycle, and, and the first, the primary focus is on the domestic matters, and that's what this president's been focused on, and trying to get his education and tax and budget and so forth launched and Social Security and so forth. There is a European travel. He's been to, he's been to Japan, he's been to Mexico, but there's European travel scheduled for this summer, and they're starting to, to work on that, but that's, it can't be all places at all things. Again, he has to be disciplined and focused and have priorities for the first month, second month, third month. And as Carl Rove and others laid out the 180-day plan, uh, the focus was to try to get his domestic things launched and in good stead before he turned to his international uh, matters. And, and that will come as he travels or internationally starting this summer. Rick Burke, do you have an opinion about the, the issue of his perspective of, uh, of the world? Um, I think he's learning. I mean, he told me a couple years ago, I, I asked him about your, I asked that very question, and he said, listen, my foreign policy experience is Mexico. And it was a very candid, blunt answer, but he really had not thought out the world in that way. And I think he's really learning, and I think you're right to question his interest and curiosity because he hasn't traveled. I don't believe he's traveled to London or Paris yet, for example. Um, he certainly had the opportunity, but he hasn't. So, so there are questions about his, his worldview, and we'll, and we'll see. Um, I think what I've heard from some, um, what you hear from abroad sometimes is people have a certain confidence in him because of his father. Some of these foreign leaders knew his father, and I think that you can't underestimate how that has helped him in many ways politically get to the White House, get the presidential nomination, because there's a sense somehow that because his father had such international experience and interest that it will somehow rub off on his son. You heard more than once during the whole China situation, people, people would say, well, you know, he might not know quite what to do, but he can always call his dad. And you can, you can laugh about that, but I think it's a very real, it, it gives people, I think, a certain sense of security. David Gergen, you had a comment you wanted to make? Well, I think to be fair to the president, uh, the, the world changed when the Berlin Wall collapsed. Uh, presidents were spending two thirds of their time on foreign policy prior to that time, and after that, they spent one third or less of their time on foreign policy. And the same complaints uh, that are now coming from Europe, why doesn't he spend, pay more attention to us, were coming 
in the same way with even more valuable during the first months of the Bush, uh, the Clinton administration. I mean, foreign leaders could not get an appointment uh, with President Clinton in those early months. I mean, it was just too difficult. Uh, I, I think, I, so I don't think that's the issue, whether they're, I, you know, he's got a team that's paying attention to it. To, to, to me, the challenge is really one of political management again. It's political leadership. Uh, th this administration clearly wants, it has its right, to make changes in American policy. That's what an election is about. At the same time, the United States has to be a leader within the world community to bring other nations along with it. This isn't something you can just do unilaterally. You can't simply say, by dicta, here's where we're going, the world's going to go from now on, now follow us. You have to bring people with you, and I think that they've got some, I think that that's still, a, 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 they're still, I don't think they're there yet on that. Uh, two, two examples, which I think raised some fundamental questions. Uh, the speech yesterday implied that the ABM treaty is dead. Well, the United States is a signatory to the ABM treaty. The, the United States was also a signatory to the Kyoto Protocol. Now, it was obviously voted down by the Senate in 95 to nothing. Everybody knows the United States is not going to enact it, but we are a signatory to it. I think if you're going to walk away from treaties to which we are formally committed, you have to do that in a way that brings others along with you to persuade them that this is a good thing to do. That's leadership. That's what international leadership is about. And I think that's, you know, I think in due course, the President will pay more personal attention to that. But in the meantime, I think the people around him uh, need to be paying attention to it. Yes, over here. My name is David Marks. I'm a graduate student from MIT. I'm from London. I have to be very honest and say my question was almost identical to the previous one. Uh, in the sense that many Europeans uh, are very uneasy with the president's complete and utter lack of experience in geopolitics. So I guess I don't have a question anymore. It was almost identical to the previous one. But I would just say, with the greatest respect to David Gergen, that the Berlin Wall collapsing and Russia going bust doesn't mean that the world is a, less of a complex place. Um, and in many people's view, is no, um, no compensation for the fact that the most powerful person on the planet has little or no experience in geopolitics. Okay, duly noted, thank you. Yes. I'm Alexander Kravitz. I'm a graduate of the Kennedy School and I'm from El Salvador. And um, since we're talking about foreign policy, I have a specific question for Mr. Johnson, but I'd like to say that we in Latin America are very happy that uh, the president's focus has been on Latin America. <laughs> <laughs> Initial focus. <coughs> the question for Mr. Johnson is, when, when the president was a candidate, he talked about this initiative of the America's fellows to be modeled on the White House fellows. And I think he first talked about it at the University of Miami. And he proposed it more formally now in, uh, in the recent summit. And I have two questions. One is, who's the point person at the White House on that? And I'm wondering if you might talk in a little more detail how, what, well, what's that going to be yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, To Mr. Johnson, yeah. Um, I, I really don't know. I'm, I'm the White House fellows. The White House fellows person reports to me, uh, and she's we just started to work three weeks ago. But I'm not, I, I'm not, do not know the answer to your question. Thank Sorry. You. Yes, over here. My name is Mike Weisman. I work at the Kennedy School. Now, um, the administration first rolled back the lower arsenic standard, but I've also read since then that um, it may be undertaking its own uh, new study and may set a limit uh, between 3 and 20, if I remember correctly, and I may not, so please um, let me know if I'm wrong, as opposed to the, the 10 which Clinton uh, had put in place. Now, looking at that or looking at the, the general public outcry against arsenic, CO2, ANWR, salmonella, oil drilling, everything else, do you think uh, specifically in the matter of environmental policy that the administration after the first 100 days will try to take a more moderate tone, more in line with what most Americans seem to think about the environment or will continue as it has been for the most part. Martha, you want to tackle that one? The, the, the week um, prior to, uh, to Earth Day, uh, they, they took a, um, a host of measures, including um, having the, the people who had negotiated a treaty on chemical pollutants uh, come into the Rose Garden, and he brought in um, Secretary of State Powell and EPA Administrator uh, Christy Todd Whitman. And so they've, they have recognized that uh, the difficulties that they are in, and, uh, and, and they have been doing one thing after another on, that, uh, on the environment 
to try to, uh, to counteract that image. But uh, images that are established early on are difficult, uh, are difficult to change. And uh, they clearly have their work cut out for them. One thing that I'd like to say in, in the case of both um, of Powell and Whitman is one of the difficulties that one could see, and uh, particularly in, in uh, the foreign policy area, has been the way that they have been undercut, uh, where, the, um, where they have taken positions publicly that the, uh, the president has required that they go back on. And uh, that is, the uh, cabinet secretary can't take too many of those, because when they then travel abroad, uh, their credibility is, uh, is questioned, as was the, as the case in the, uh, in the dealings with um, North Korea, and, uh, and we know with, um, with Christy Whitman on Anwar and her statements, and uh, then on CO2. Elaine, I know you have some views about the way this will be used. I mean, do you think that this is a, uh, you know, a, an exploitable but uh, and impossible for the Republicans and for the Bush administration to reverse image issue as far as uh, the environment especially is concerned? Well, it's, it's not impossible, and, and a lot of it, of course, depends on what Clay does in the next couple months because, you know, the question is when they get a sub-cabinet in place, the sub-cabinet really begins to take a lot of actions that can either reinforce this initial negative image or, in fact, start to turn it around. So right now, we don't, we don't really know. Um, obviously, you can, you can always overcome things that happen in the first 100 days. Um, Bill Clinton had about as bad a first 100 days as you could imagine and as about as bad a transition as you can imagine any one re-election. So again, everything is reversible. Uh, let me also say something about this discipline question. Um, for all the virtue in starting meetings on time, and, I, and having spent much of my life waiting to go into meetings with Bill Clinton, I can tell you there's a lot of virtue in this. Um, the fact is that there has been some pretty bad discipline gaps in the White House. There's been a lot of contradictions between presidential statements and cabinet statements, between cabinet statements and presidential statements, and between presidential statements and campaign statements. Now, the White House has one big job, which is to coordinate those and have the administration speak with one voice. And I think that the whatever the virtues of starting meetings on time are, it has not operated so far in many critical areas to have the administration give one consistent message. They haven't. There's been corrections, there's been retractions, there's been back and forth, and I, and I think that that's not a good sign. Clay, do you want to respond to Elaine or let it pass? Let it pass. <laughs> <laughs> yes, over here. Hi, my name's Peter Buttigieg. I'm a first year student at the college here. Um, it's my understanding from generations older than mine that most of the people in them who went into public service did so out of inspiration for a grand figure who was usually the American president. Um, as we've discussed, it seems that the presidency has now evolved into what's called the MBA White House or the corporate model I mean, among presidents comparative obscurity. I guess my question is somebody who loves being here in the, in the shadow of President Kennedy and who, if I weren't here right now, would be at home watching my favorite show, The West Wing. <laughs> um, wh what's happened to the uh, image of the American presidency? And just because we know more about the men who are president, is, is that magic really gone forever? Let me ask David Gergen to respond to that. <laughs> Peter, that's a really good question. Uh, and uh, the magic has certainly been has certainly been diminished. The office has been tarnished over the years. I don't think you can lay this, by the way, just at George W. Bush's door. I don't think that's fair to him. Uh, there have been some of several of his predecessors who have been hardly inspirations uh, and have hardly appealed to the idealism of youth. Uh, I, th I, th I think it's a worthy challenge of this president to see if he can stir you and others knowing that it may, be hard, it may be hard for him on a Harvard campus, but there are other places in the country where, you know, other universities where fine students go, you know, where who might really get stirred. I do think this is one of the biggest questions facing your generation, because you've got a very idealistic generation. Uh, your generation, in my judgment, is much more spiritual 
than some of the people a little older. I think that you all, by and large, are much, much better educated. But as far as I can tell, many people in your generation are rejecting politics and rejecting government as, a, as, a, as an instrument for change. You go into nonprofits, you do a lot of other things. Uh, here at the Kennedy School, you know, only half our graduates go into government. It was Kennedy School of Government. Uh, uh, this is, uh, you, know, you know, many go over to McKinsey or other things like that. And it's a question of pay, in partly, is, but it's also a question of the nobility of the service and a sense of what one gets out of that. And I think one of the big challenges of the older generation now, recognizing that one half the people in the civil service today are going to re be eligible for retirement within five years, 65% of the senior executive service is going to be eligible for early retirement within five years. Plus, you've got this busted, broken down system of appointments so that you don't, it's hard to get people to, to put themselves into this process. One of, the real, you know, one of the real challenges now is to make an appeal to you uh, that both reaches towards your idealism but also gives you a place where you can go and be inspired by what you're doing. Many of you don't want to do this because you think it's a bureaucracy down, you know, if you go into Washington or state government or whatever. And corporations have found ways now to, wait, you know, to empower people, to push power down in, to push leadership down to the organizations, to make it very adaptable, very fluid, and we have to be looking at ways to do that. That's one of the reasons I think we should be excited about the innovations program coming here to the Kennedy School because it's going, to, it's going to introduce that spirit of innovation much more deeply into the Kennedy School and the Harvard. And that really has to come to government. I don't care whether it's a Republican administration or Democratic administration, but we have to create a sense, again, for your generation that public service is a noble calling. I think we can do that. Elaine and, and then Rick. Uh, uh, thank you again. That's a wonderful question. That brings up one of the things to, that's been mysterious to me about this presidency. If you are in a political campaign, there, there are two sort of sets of polling questions that you use to, over and over and over again for two years, right? One set is about positions on issues and policies, and the other all are questions that in one way or another get to the question of whether or not you trust this person to be president. You trust them on the issues that you don't even know are going to come up. What do you feel? And frankly, during the campaign, George Bush had the big advantage over Al Gore on trust issues. He just, he just did. It was just a consistent thing. Part of that was, the Bill, was Bill Clinton's problems. Part of this was, were Al Gore's own um, mistakes, et cetera. And so what has been curious to me in then the transition in the first 100 days is that it's almost the reverse of their advantage in the campaign. That in other words, the man George Bush has kind of moved away from the headlines and he has pushed forward policies that are not, in fact, very popular policies. So what we have people focusing on is his policy leadership, which frankly was never his strong suit. And I think that he's looking, at, partially by the way this White House has, has managed him, et cetera. And, I, and, I, and let me say, I'm sure he's probably a very smart guy. But I don't think that this White House has served him well so far in letting anybody in America build the trust in him as president that a lot of people had when he was a candidate. And I find that a very hmm. interesting and problematic um, reversal in this first 100 days. Rick Burke. Let me just say quickly, we talk about passion for politics and for politicians. I think some of it depends on who the politician is. And I think part of the problem is we just haven't had inspirational leaders lately. Al Gore, for instance, I mean, I would go to these events. I mean, people would not, you know, give their all for Al Gore. And, and I've never seen so many aides that were so much backfighting and turmoil and disloyalty. Elaine was very loyal, but not many others were. <laughs> and it's, I don't think it says, speaks well for Al Gore that there was such um, lack of a loyal team that stood by him. I mean, the day, after, day or two after the election, I talked to a lot of Democrats around the country who had supported him during the campaign, and they just were ready to turn on, turn on him just like that. People who were very active in his campaign publicly repudiating, repudiating him, saying, we're not going to support him, or he's going to have a tough time if he runs again. He just wasn't that kind of leader. Now, 
President Bush, it's different in the sense that people, he was able to um, surround himself with people who really trust him, um, loyal aides, and I think that's helped him a lot throughout his relatively brief political career. Um, people like this guy, they trust him, but I think the public itself, the general public, doesn't feel that way about this president. I think um, I, I'll talk to Republicans out there. They still miss Ronald Reagan. They still long for the days of Ronald Reagan. And I think the reason why there was such an outpouring in the primaries for George Bush wasn't George Bush the man or that he was this inspirational figure, is that Republicans were so hungry for the White House that they just wanted to get it back at any cost, and they saw him as the best vehicle to win it back. But I think if some more inspirational leader comes along, someone that people can really believe in, and you know, um, I think the passion may still may come back. Over here. Good evening, I'm Chris Kierkoff, I'm a senior at the college, and this question will be primarily towards uh, Mr. Johnson. There's been a lot of talk this evening about the smooth transition and about the impressive staff that George W. Bush has placed around himself in the White House. But conspicuously absent from the staff is the presidential science advisor, someone who has not yet been named and put into place. And this is someone who not only sits in the Domestic Policy Council, but on the Foreign Policy Council, and who has his own National Science and Technology Council that deals with questions that are of vital interest. And as all these decisions that the Bush administration has made come down the road, uh, that oftentimes, as with uh, the RCM decision, deal with the state of science, uh, this is a rather conspicuous uh, gap. Uh, moreover, there's also been some talk, actually, within the Office of Science and Technology Policy, a place where I used to intern, of dismantling the Environment Division, which is actually where I used to work, uh, or at least work when we weren't being subpoenaed by Dan Burton, that is. Um, and um, which leads to, to, to another question. Um, as, an, as an intern, um, I had a wonderful opportunity and experience to be there, and that is a program that the administration has decided to discontinue, at least this summer, and I'm curious to hear, as a young person in the room, uh, not only what the Bush administration will be doing for science and technology, but also what they will be doing uh, for the potential interns. Mm -hmm. um, your question hurts me a lot because most stuff, the, the, the sub-cabinet appointments so forth, I have associate directors and presidents and personnel that are working on that. I personally am working on the search for the science and technology advisor, and so you're not the only one that's asking me that question. The president <laughs> just last Friday said, Clay, Where's the science and technology advisor? Um, they, I think, in um, uh, I think in past administrations, those I was looking at when those appointments have been typically made. They're typically been made in the summer, but so it's anyway. But we're, we're past due. There is a lot of science. There are a lot of key issues that are going to face this administration that involve a, a good interpretation of science and um, you, you, I mean environmental and military and and medical and so forth and. There is no thought, no, no anything, uh, no, no concept at all about uh, downplaying the role of the Science and Technology Policy Office. We just haven't uh, identified the person. One of the things I've realized here in analysis I've done the last few days is uh, the kind of people we've been talking to about that are uh, loftier credentialed than have typically held that position in the past. Uh, which I need to get more realistic about what we need in there, but our, our commitment to that is huge. This administration's commitment to that office is, is substantial, uh, and I just have not filled the position yet with the help. For, I mean, have not had presented somebody to the president yet for his sign off. And the intern program? The what? The intern program? What was the question about the intern program? The Bush administration does not have an intern program at this point in time. It's chosen to discontinue, at least for this summer, the White House intern program. Well, we have an intern program in the executive office of the president. Maybe your concern is that the internships are unpaid. That's another one of my concerns, sir. Yeah, well, <laughs> they, I nailed it. I knew it. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Justin Hotard. I'm a first-year MBA at Sloan. So, Mr. Johnson, it's great to see you here this evening. Um, my question is actually about uh, foreign policy with respect to China. Mr. Burke, you mentioned that, uh, that the Bush administration handled China well, and I agree with you in the short term, but when you look at uh, some of the long-term issues, uh, the, from the Chinese perspective, they lost face, and uh, also the hardliners gained some political power over the recent, uh, the recent events over the last few months. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm curious to get 
uh, the panel's thoughts about how the administration should handle uh, U.S.-China relations going forward. Thank you. U.S.-China relations, who wants to tackle that? <laughs> Rick Burke. If you all are looking at me to answer that question, we are in some serious trouble. So, no, I want no part of that. Rick, do you have some, well, some thoughts? Let me just say on that particular episode, I think there were, there were real questions about how the president conducted himself at the beginning. Um, I spoke, um, I, I speak, and broadly speaking, if you step back, we got out of it okay. And I think a president should get high marks for that. But um, I, what struck me about that is how he got really got a pass, except from Bill Kristol in the Weekly Standard, he got a real pass from conservatives um, by that sort of apologetic letter to the Chinese that I think Bill Clinton or any Democrat wouldn't have gotten, gotten away with. And I think there, there are some examples of, which, which brings us to another issue we haven't really discussed, which is this president has done more for conservatives than even Ronald Reagan. He's very popular among conservatives. And for that reason, on matters like China, he seems to be getting, um, they're, they're giving him a pass. And I, that doesn't answer the whole China thing, but I'm not a China expert, so. David, do you want to make a comment? No. <laughs> <laughs> I want to come back to the uh, Peters question now. One issue we have not talked about, about tonight is campaign finance reform. And while all these other issues are getting high play, campaign finance reform is beginning to die in the House. Uh, the, and whatever you may think about McCain fine go, whether you think that's the right way to go or the wrong way to go, it's very apparent that unless we address the flow of money through the system, many young people who come to schools like this are going to feel the system is corrupted in some fashion. It's, it's, being, it's in, the, in the hands of big interests. Why should I get involved and be a pawn in that system? What attracts young people to the system is they think they've got an authentic candidate or an authentic person who really has deep beliefs, unpaid for by commercial sponsors, uh, and you know, and, and, and go somewhere with those beliefs. And, and you, you can argue about what the form of that ought to be, but I would hope that both the press and others would keep the focus on let's get this system cleaned up. It's the best way to get young people back in. One of the best ways. Good, good news. Thank you. Uh, before we before we adjourn, I'd like to I'd like to mention something uh, that I neglected to mention at the beginning, and I should have. This was a, a special kind of panel. It was really a, a joint effort by a lot of people here at the Kennedy School. It was co-sponsored by uh, the uh, Center for Public Leadership, uh, the Consortium on Global Leadership, the Institute of Politics, and the Joan Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. It was a, quite a cooperative effort. Uh, we uh, had to, you know, delay it and put it together, but we thought that it was an important thing to bring, and I hope that, uh, that you've uh, enjoyed it. I want to thank the panelists. Thank you all very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be with you.